and preach and proclaim your word. I pray that hearts are open and attentive and that the, the power of the gospel just brings about good fruit and salvation um, all around our world this morning. Be glorified. Be lifted up. We ask this this morning in the power of Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Get around and welcome one another if you would.
Team the big hand. We appreciate them. Kiddos, you can head on out to Kids Church. We release you. Go. Run hard. Drive glory crazy. Like that. Hey, grab your Bibles this morning and turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And I want to begin this morning reading verses 1 through 10 together. Luke chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If 
your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, should say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. If you've been with us for a while, you know that several weeks ago I told you that when we got to the end of Luke chapter 16, I wanted to jump into a new series. And we're going to do that starting next week. Next week we are going to put the Gospel of Luke on hold probably for several weeks. And we're going to jump into a new series that I've titled Dying, Death, and Life After This Life. We are going to look at what the Bible has to say about the process of dying, death itself, what happens when we die, and the life after this life. People have a lot of questions about those three things. We're going to launch into it starting next week. I planned on doing it right at the end of chapter 16, but I decided for two reasons I wouldn't do that. One... Timing just happened to land on 4th of July weekend, and I thought, you know what, we probably will have a lot of people out, and I don't like to start a new series on a holiday weekend. We do have a lot of people out, but we've got a lot of people here too, so I very well could have started it. But the more important reason is that we have not yet finished the conversation that we have been studying for the last eight weeks. But this passage actually brings it to a close. But the conversation we've been in, for those of you who've been with, with us for a while, you know that this started way back in chapter 15. Verse 1 says that the tax collectors and the sinners were all coming around Jesus to hear him teach. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled and they said, This man receives sinners and he eats with them. This cold-hearted, hypocritical, loveless attitude launched Jesus into a series of teaching from parables. Which, by the way, Jesus like, likes to uh, teach in a series as well, so I'm just saying that would be company. But Jesus goes into this series of teaching, one parable after another. He started with the parable of the loving shepherd who had a, a hundred sheep and one of them went astray, and he loved that sheep so much that he went and searched for it. He left the ninety-nine and went to look for the one. Next parable of the woman who had ten coins. She lost one of them, and she searched her whole house, swept everything until she found that one lost coin. The parable of the loving father who had two lost sons. Not just one prodigal, but two lost sons. The parable of the dishonest manager. The parable about two men, a rich man and Lazarus. Two deaths, two destinations. That's where we spent the last few weeks. Well, today we come to the end of this conversation. And I know it's the end of the conversation because if you look at verse 11, which we didn't read this morning, but look back there. It says that on the way to Jerusalem... He was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. So I believe we're still in the same conversation here. And right after this conversation, Jesus leaves town. He begins to head to Jerusalem. So he's kind of wrapping up everything here, this, the end of the conversation. And he's no longer speaking in parables. Today we're going to hear some straightforward stuff. Now before we jump into it, I do want to say, and some of you may have study Bibles and in the notes... Your notes may say something different than what I actually believe is going on here. Because scholars are really divided. I'm not a Bible scholar, but there's basically two camps here um, that deal with this passage. Some of them believe that the passage we read, verses 1 through 10, is not part of the previous conversation that we've been in for the past eight weeks. A lot of Bible scholars believe that Luke took this opportunity in his letter to insert some teaching that he heard Jesus teach somewhere else. So this could have been several months earlier or several months later, and Luke just found an opportunity here in his letter to kind of, it's all from Jesus, but it's not in the order or, or, or part of the same context. I'm of the camp that says that's not the case. A lot of them believe that because they don't see any clear connections 
to everything else that was just said. I think there's at least a few very solid connections that connect it to the same conversation, and I want to point those out to you this morning as we go on. So let's walk right through this passage together and see how Jesus brings this conversation to an end before he takes off for Jerusalem, which, by the way, is very significant. Because we all know what happens when he gets to Jerusalem, right? Crucifixion. So all of this is probably within months, maybe weeks, of the crucifixion of our Lord. Verse 1, going back to chapter 17, verse 1, Luke tells us Jesus is speaking out to his disciples. Remember, there's a crowd of people here, his disciples, uh, the tax collectors, the sinners, the Pharisees, and the scribes. This is all the people in the group. So now he, he, he directs his attention to his disciples, and he says to them, temptations to sin are sure to come. If you have the NIV, I think the NIV captures this a little bit better. It says, things that cause people to stumble are bound to happen. The word stumble there is from the Greek word skandala. It's where we get the word scandal. It's where I, so I can paraphrase this morning. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, among my disciples, among the church, people are going to stumble. There's going to be scandals. Bad things are going to happen among Jesus' followers. Not just out in the world. If you've, been, if you've grown up in church, you know that sometimes bad, ugly things happen in church too. Jesus says these things are bound to happen. It's going to take place. There's going to be stumbling blocks that are going to cause people to trip up. And that's why I believe that this is one of the connections Jesus is making to the other parables. The religious leaders of Israel were stumbling blocks for the entire nation. In Matthew 15, Jesus says of the scribes and the Pharisees, he says, let them alone. They're blind guides. They're blind guides leading blind people, and both of them will fall into a pit. So once again, I think Jesus is referring to the scribes and the Pharisees, even in this final passage. But what I really want you to hear is what Jesus says here. Scandal, stumbling, problems, bad, ugly situations are bound to occur. They're going to happen. And unfortunately, they happen a lot, and those outside the church love to point to scandals within the church and say, Aha! You're not the people you think you are. You're old enough to remember the Jim Baker scandals? That was a horrible taint on the church for years. Not long after Jim Baker came, Jimmy Swagger had another terrible scandal. There for a while, it seemed to be just one scandal after another. More recently, we've had a lot of the health and wealth prosperity teachers who've gotten caught up in different scandals, different church divisions. When these things happen, people outside the church often point to us and say, aha, 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 you all are a bunch of immigrants, you're liars, you're fakes, you're phonies. You are not what you claim to be. I want to just throw the question out there this morning, what do we claim to be? What do we really claim to be? I don't know a single Christian who says, Christians are all perfect. We are not going to have problems. We're not going to struggle. I don't know anybody that says that. If they do, they're, they're ridiculous. I don't know a single Christian that goes around with a I'm better than you attitude over unbelievers. And yet, that's what we're often accused of. You do good Christians. You're all a bunch of holier than thou. Do we really go around saying that? Are there, Folks, we are in no way perfect people. But here's what we are. We're sinners, saved by God's perfect grace. That's what we are. When scandal or division hits the church, and those outside the church want to use that to prove that our faith in God is false and fake, well, let me just say this. These scandalous and sinful behaviors within the body, they are not evidence that we are false, only that we are flawed. We are a flawed people. You know why? Because this life we live by faith, we still live in the flesh. And this flesh is going to well up every now and again, and we're going to do some dumb, ugly, sinful stuff from time to time. Jesus is saying, it's going to occur. In verse 1, he comes back with a but. In other words, scandals, scandals are going to happen. Bad things, something blocks are going to occur. But woe to the one through whom they come. Whoa, anytime you read a woe in scripture, you need to whoa. You need to slow down. Because Jesus just 
pronounce some form of judgment here. That's what woe means. It means you better get ready. It's like when your parent looks at you and says, oh, wait till we get home. That's a woe, right? Jesus says, woe to the one through whom they come. And again, I can just see Jesus sitting around this crowd, looking over. He's talking to his disciples, and he looks over at the Pharisees. And he says, woe to the ones through whom these stumbling blocks come. I think he's still referring to them. You know your Old Testament? You know that Israel stumbled many times. They would stumble. They would sin. God would bring judgment on them. They would repent. God would deliver them. And then guess what they'd do? Sin again. And then they'd stumble. And God would bring judgment. And they'd repent. And God would deliver them. This process went over and over and over. And you know who was leading them into sin almost every time? Their leaders. Their priests. Their teachers. Their kings. One of the main points Jesus is making here is this. You don't want to be the sorry sap sucker. That is a stumbling block for somebody else. You no way want to be that. Stumbling's going to happen. Sin's going to occur. Bad things, good people, Christian people are going to do bad things. But you don't want to be the one that leads somebody into that. I think this is one of the things James was getting at when he says in James chapter 3, not many of you should become teachers. That might surprise some of you. An apostle actually says not many of you should desire to be a teacher. Do you know why he says that? Well, he tells us. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. James is saying, be careful. Don't just jump into a teaching ministry because the moment you take on that role, you're going to be held to a higher standard. A stricter judgment. It's not a light thing to do that. Teaching, or I should say misteaching, false teaching has been one of the greatest sources of stumbling for the church throughout history. So in no way do we want to be a person who stands before Jesus someday and has to say, yeah, I led some people wrong. I led people away from the gospel. And then Jesus in verse 2 pronounces what's going to happen to those people. He says, it would be better for a person like that if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. A millstone was just a great big rock that had been carved out with a hole through the middle of it, and they would put a big post, and they would connect that to a big beam, and that beam would be connected to an oxen or some type of animal, and that oxen would walk in a big circle, and they would dump out grain in front of this big stone. It was a millstone, and that stone would just crush the grain, but it was huge, super heavy. Jesus says it would be better for that person if he had one of those stones wrapped around his neck, tied around his neck, and he was cast into the sea. Now, please keep in mind, he's not saying that that's the punishment for a false teacher or somebody that causes someone to stumble. He says that would be a better punishment. <laughs> it would be better for him if that would happen. So Jesus is using what we call Jewish hyperbole here to drive home this very serious, heinous sin of causing a little one to stumble. There we go. There's another question we have. Who are the little ones in this text? Again, people are divided on this. Some believe that Jesus is sitting there and he's speaking to this crowd of people and just maybe a little kid came running up into the crowd. Uh, we know Jesus cared a lot about children. Matter of fact, if you were with us a couple Wednesday nights ago and watching The Chosen, the whole episode was dedicated to Jesus and little kids. It might have been that Jesus picked up a little child and set him on his lap in this moment and said, man, you better not do anything to hurt one of these little ones. For years, I thought that's what Jesus meant in this text. I see it a little bit differently, although I still believe that Jesus loves little children and wants to protect them and care for them. But little ones could also refer to those who are new in the faith, those who are weak in the faith, or it could refer to those who are just on the verge of saving faith. Now think about this for a minute. Who in this crowd could that be? Probably the scribe, I'm sorry, probably the uh, tax collectors and the sinners. So in essence, I think the way I interpret this is Jesus is looking at his disciples and said, there's going to be a lot of assembly blocks. Those are inevitable. And then he looks over at the scribes and the Pharisees and he says, but woe to you who caused these little ones to stumble. Woe to you who would want to keep them out of the kingdom. Woe to you who would say, oh, I can't believe he eats with tax collectors and sinners. 
In the words of Mr. T, I pity the fool who would do such a thing. It's kind of how that reads. I pity the fool. Some of you don't even know who Mr. T is. You guys didn't know who Mr. T is. You probably don't do. You don't know who Mr. T is. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Moving right along. Verse 3. Jesus now turns directly to his disciples and he says something that we all need to grasp hold of this morning. Verse 3, he says, Pay attention to yourselves. Or pay careful, close attention to yourselves. Here Jesus introduces a common theme that we see throughout the New Testament. Self-examination. Man, it's so important that we really search our own hearts on a regular basis. Matter of fact, we try to do this every time we come to the Lord's table. We're going to do it this morning. Before you take these elements, you need to have some time of self-examination. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. It's a serious thing we're getting ready to do. This table is not for perfect people, but it is for redeemed people. And if you're a redeemed person this morning and you know you have sin in your life, something you need to confess and repent, you need to do it before you come to this table. But this idea of self-examination runs throughout the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 13. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, Paul says. In the Old Testament, the psalmist prayed in Psalms 139. I love this. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I would encourage you to write that one down. Add that one to your prayer list. Pray it every day if you can. Oh, God, search my heart. Let me know if there's any bad stuff there. See if there's any offensive way in me at all. Once again, folks, because you're redeemed, because you're forgiven, you're saved, doesn't mean that sin's not going to try to take root in your heart. It will. And every day we need to say, Lord, reveal it to me. Show me where I'm screwing up. Show me where I'm weak. Reveal that to me. Because we are sinners, we're saved up by grace, but we are flawed people. And oftentimes there are offensive ways that takes root in our heart. And Jesus goes right into one of the most offensive sins that you and I can deal with. And I think every one of us probably struggle with this on some level. Forgiveness. Or lack of forgiveness. Listen to what he says after he tells them, pay close attention to yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Now, before we go on, let me make something real clear. This is not if your brother or sister irritates you. This is not if they just rub you off. This is not if they're talking during the ball game or during the movie. This is not they just cut you off and track. Jesus said, if somebody, particularly a Christian brother or sister, if they sin against you, in other words, they do something that is clearly a violation in God's word, here's what you should do. Number one, sin back. Get them back as good as you can. Nope. Does it tell us to do that at all? Matter of fact, Paul says in Romans 12, repay no one evil for you. Don't ever give back evil for you. Jesus said, if somebody sins against you, Rebuke him. That word rebuke, it means to warn or reprove somebody in order to prevent or end an action. It's not to humiliate somebody, defeat them, or drive them away. It means to lovingly correct and restore them. So if you know somebody commits a sin against you, you should go to them lovingly and say, Hey, what you did was terribly wrong. I, I, you're a believer, right? Then you've got to know that's wrong. And if you know it's wrong, you should really repent of that. And ask God to forgive you. Again, this is not so much that I feel better. It's that your relationship with Christ is restored as it should be. Now get this. If they say, you're right. I sinned. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. What do we do? Jesus said, you forgive them. If they sin against you, and you confront them with it, and they say, all right, you're right, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Jesus said, forgive them. Now, here's where things get tough. What if they do it again? What if somebody sins against you, they hurt you deeply, you confront them, they repent, 
they say I'm sorry, they promise they won't do it again, and you forgive them, and they turn right around and they do it again. I tell you what, my sinful heart says, mm, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I ain't going there again. I'm not forgiving them. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says there in verse 4, if he sins against you, not seven times. Can you imagine somebody doing the same sin seven times? But get this. He says if somebody sins against you seven times in a single day. What? Seven times in one day. And all seven times they turn to you and they say, I repent. What is your response to me? I forgive you. It's no wonder Jesus adds this teaching in the same context of stumbling blocks. Because i got to tell you, this is a stumbling block for your preacher. I struggle with this. Because for years I felt like, you know what, I can forgive somebody once, maybe twice, but no more than that. And then, of course, we always wrestle with this, you know what, I would forgive somebody, but i got to see the fruit of it first. got to know that it's sincere. Do you notice that Jesus does not say that here? He doesn't say... Give them some time and see if they're being real about it. He says, upon their confession of repentance, you forgive. That's mind-blowing to me. Each and every time they do it, we forgive. Why? Why would Jesus tell us that? Here's your answer. Because that's exactly what he does for you. That's exactly what he does. How many times have you ever went before the Lord in prayer and said, Oh, God, I screwed up royally. Why did I do that? I'm so sorry. I won't do it again. And then within minutes, you do it again. Maybe the next day. The next week. I don't know about you, but I've prayed a lot of the same confessional prayers over and over and over and over. And what's great is, I know he hears me over and over and over. No, he forgives me over and over and over. He doesn't wait till I leave and go, you know, show that I'm sincere. He says, in that moment, you're forgiven. It's covered. Folks, the reason that a lot of us, including your preacher, stumble, we stumble in the area of forgiveness is because we never truly understand the depth of our own sinfulness and the greatness of God's grace in forgiving every single debt over and over. We somehow think our sin against God is, is minor and meek, whereas people sin against us in huge ways. That's pride. That's arrogance. Now, some of you may be sitting there thinking this morning, I know this is what the Bible says, but how in the world can I possibly get to a place where I can forgive like that? I think that's exactly what verse 5 is getting at. The apostles heard Jesus say this. You know what their response is? Increase our faith, Lord. Lord, we can't pull this off on our own. How in the world can I forgive like that? You're going to have to. You're going to have to give me some supernatural faith. You're going to have to help us. Jesus responds with one of his favorite metaphors. It's a metaphor of a mustard seed, one of the smallest of all garden seeds, and he tells them. All you need is faith that size. In other words, he's saying, you don't need great faith to pull this off. You need faith in a great God. God is going to empower you to do that. And I want you to know this morning, when you became a believer, I firmly believe that Jesus fills every believer with his spirit. We become temples, dwelling places of God. His own spirit lives in us as believers. It's there. By his grace, he begins to work through that spirit. I firmly believe that God empowers us to do everything he commands us to do. He doesn't put us out there and say, go be holy, and then says, aha, you don't have any power to be holy. Do you? Sorry. He doesn't put us out there and say, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't do these things, and then we look around and say, God, I, I'm committing adultery every day. I just can't stop myself. Yes, you can. Paul told Titus, in Titus chapter 2, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Listen to this. 
training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. God's grace empowers us to do everything God's word commands us to do. We are without excuse. It may not be easy. It may not be comfortable. It may take us a little while to get there. But God's grace, working through God's spirit, illuminates God's word and empowers us to do everything he commands us to do. Now, as we rely on the grace of God to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright lives, we got to do this with the right attitude. And I believe that that kind of confusing passage there, verse 7 to 10, I think that's what Jesus is getting at. Verses 7 through 10, Jesus uses another metaphor, a story of a master and a slave. And it might sound kind of arrogant or weird, but let me kind of paraphrase for the sake of time what I think Jesus is getting at using this metaphor. He says, when you rely on God's grace, when you renounce ungodliness, when you overcome these temptations, you got to do so humbly. You got to do it with humility. Another stumbling block for many of us, and especially those of us, I'll say pastors especially, struggle with pride and arrogance, especially when we see some success in ministry. It is so easy, so easy for us pastors. And I'm going to tell you, you ought to go to a pastor's conference sometimes if you want to see some serious pride on display. These pastors all get together and we worship, oh, Lord, you're wonderful, you're great. And it's like, how many is in your church, by the way? We had 20 in my church when I first started there, and now we're up to 250. Pastors have these conversations all the time. You're always hearing now about how these pastors are growing the churches. We had 37 people baptized last year alone. Sweet. I always want to say, why do you count them? Why do you count them? You know, some denominations actually require that you send in numbers. You got to send in numbers to the headquarters, and they were counting. I always wonder, why do we do that? Then I heard somebody say one time, we count people because people count. We count people so we can pat ourselves on the back and walk in pride. Please hear verse 10. Jesus said, when you've done all that you've been commanded to do, you know how you really ought to, in other words, when you are successful, whether it be in ministry or even in your own spiritual growth, you know how, what your response ought to be? I'm just an unworthy servant and I'm just doing what was my duty to do. That's what he's saying. You better pat yourself on the back and take credit for it. God's doing the work in you anyway, not you. We've just done what is our duty. So let me wrap up this whole series with this. These past nine weeks, we have seen our Lord provide us with some wonderful instruction. We have been given good lessons from very bad examples. Over and over and over, he's pointed this crowd to the scribes and the Pharisees and he's He's basically saying they don't want to be those people. And this is why I feel like Paul's words to the Corinthians is very fitting as we close out this series. Paul was using another bad example, Israel's past his history of sinfulness and failure to show the church what not to do. And he wrote this, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. These things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. Father God, over these past several weeks, we've been hearing the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples, to the tax collectors and sinners, and to the scribes and Pharisees. And Lord, you have pointed over and over and over, you pointed us to this Phariseeistic attitude that, Father, as I've said many times, probably lives in all of us to a certain degree. And I pray, Father, this morning that the church would confess and repent of any Phariseeistic pride or arrogance or loveless attitudes, lack of concern for the lost. Humble us, Lord, under your mighty hand, I pray. And may we live lives, not perfect lives, we're, we are a flawed people, but we're a flawed people who have been made holy, we've been justified, we've been sanctified. May we live these lives that glorify and honor you constantly. May we live lives that please you. And 
And I thank you for these past several weeks that we've been in this instruction. And now, Father, we prepare our hearts to come to your table together. Before we do, I pray if there's anybody here, or maybe somebody even listening on, online this morning, if there's anyone that does not know you personally and powerfully, they've not been resurrected to a new life, then I pray this morning that they would hear the gospel message. You love them. You've provided a way for them to escape the coming wrath and be born again to a new and living hope. Let that message sink into their hearts this morning by your great grace. As our heads are bowed this morning, that's my call, as it is every week. Is there anyone that would say, that's me, I am not a born-again believer, I do not know Jesus personally and powerfully, and I know in my heart that if I died today, heaven would not be my eternal home. If that's you, I want to know who you are so I can pray with you. Is there anybody I can pray with before we come to the Lord's table together? Anybody? Praise God. And I'm going to ask you to take some time, as we said this morning, in self-examination. I'm going to ask the ushers to go ahead and come on up and start handing out the communion elements. As they do, just quietly reflect. Spend some time together there, just you and the Lord. We will take communion together, and then we'll close with one last song.
stand with me if you would. They were passing out community to Donna. We've had a lot of different instructions come to us over these past eight weeks. Jesus said a lot of different areas in his teaching. But I want to bring you to John chapter 13 as we take communion together this morning. And Jesus, looking at his disciples, said again, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I've loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. Gracious God, the symbols that we hold in our hand this morning are symbols of love. What greater love is there than one would lay down his life for his friends? But your word says, I thank you for your great and amazing love that has been poured into all of our hearts this morning. We come to your table remembering that loving sacrifice, your broken body, your shed blood, and that blood that covers us, cleanses us, and makes us holy and righteous. It's all possible because you loved us, Lord. I thank you that you loved us before we ever loved you. And I pray that you just continue to pour your love out in our hearts, even as we take these symbols and as we sing this last song of praise before we close. Lord, just be loved by us right now. And we ask this again in the name of your Son, Jesus. Let's take these together.
be our desire each and every day, Lord God, is to wake up in the morning with more than 10,000 reasons, God, that your love and your grace, your living hope, Lord God, that we have in you dwells within us, Lord God, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Let us not ever forget that, Lord God. I pray now that you be with each and everybody that's here, each and everybody that's with us online and joining us, God, that you would be with them the rest of this day, the rest of this weekend. Help everybody to have a good time together, enjoy time with their family and their friends, Lord God. Let everybody be safe and bring us all back together again, Lord God, this next Sunday so that we can worship you in word, worship you in song, Lord God. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Slackers. 